The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew Meredith, how you going? Pretty good. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It is good to be here. Today, uh, we are talking two cents episode on the Australian Investors Podcast when we did the analytics for March. Drew, Drew, Drew. Surprise, surprise. The two cents format is resonating really well. People seem to like tuning in on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. to hear our shenanigans plus some wisdom. Is it bad that I find that surprising? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I don't know. I do have a hypothetical question for you, though, Drew. Something that I heard on a podcast. Um, and I heard this on a podcast before it was podcasting. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, can you have good sex in a bear market? <laughs> <That's> sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go up from here, I think. <laughs> Damn it. I was hoping to wait till you had that. I think it was one of those waiting. I was hoping you would have uh, that stubby of water in your mouth when you uh, when, <laughs> when I said that, but it was a bit too early. Um, so that was my hypothetical question. Are we in a bear market? Well, that's the question. Are we? I just go high-pitched. That was a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty emotional, I guess. Um, are we in a bear market? Not in Australia, but I think we are in pretty much every market overseas. Yeah. What about New Zealand? I haven't looked at New Zealand. I think it's quite small. No offense to the Kiwis. Yeah, no offense. Uh, I haven't actually... What is the... Yeah, okay, main board. I don't know. Anyway, um, well, the NASDAQ, depending on which market, how do you define a bear market? That's probably the Bear market, so a correction is usually 10% off the high. Mm -hmm. A bear market is usually defined as 20% off the market high is considered a bear market. I think more broadly, though, you'd think a bear market is a period when markets are just generally trading lower over a long period of time and earnings and profits are falling mm. and everything's falling generally. Uh, the weird thing about markets is you can have a bear market in shares while the economy is still growing, which is what we're seeing at the moment. Yep. So the bear market's essentially predicting that the economy will get worse in the next six to 12 months. New Zealand's fine. <laughs> Oh, they're yeah. probably the same as us. They sell financial services and uh, yeah, milk and yeah, lamb. A two milk no very offense. popular. I get no offense. Auckland uh, International Airport. Um, there are many really incredible businesses out of New Zealand, and A um, two milk is still frequently traded amongst the the top stocks, most traded. So it's a great brand. So it doesn't surprise me if I've been A two milk at home. Um, so I mean, we've been working on a few new things this week. Um, one of a wonderful gentleman and his wife came into the uh, office this week. Potential client, hopefully a client. Of, yes. Yep. Of Waddle Partners came through, uh, and shout out to Dom. He said that uh, I was the best influencer, uh, influencer in Australia. <laughs> Credit to you. Credit to <laughs> Jesus. Uh, well, you know what? It's it's a lovely thing to say. Thank you, Dom. And um, I've never once ever in my life considered myself a influencer. Are you starting to embrace that? Well, I always just wonder, like, what is the definition of a finfluencer? I actually had it on a t-shirt, but I still haven't brought that t-shirt <laughs> You still in. haven't brought I it got in. Your yeah, size finance too small. <laughs> That's right. Small's good. Um, Don't wash it. Uh, what A finfluencer, I think, is, like, it's more of a der derogative term, but I, I think that's, but it's endearing in some ways as well. But if you think about it, like, Alan Collis is a finfluencer. 
He was just around before social media. <laughs> You're trying to put yourself... <laughs> no, no, but if you think about it, right? Like, like think of that, the people that, like, Noel Whitaker, like, these people, right? We don't call them influencers, but they had the most influence on people's finances for the last generation, right? Same as Austin Donnelly, who our business yeah, was exactly. kind of founded off as well. He wrote 50 books. So it was when influencing or influencing and educating, it's all about education, I think. Hmm. And that's probably the important one. There's a difference between education and selling yeah. or marketing. And I think influencers are really describing the education part. I hope that people can kill, maybe even you, you're more of a finance bro, but like... <laughs> Also a derogatory term. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I would much rather be an influencer. No offense. So, uh, but I would. I think we can take this title, and we can dispel all of the concerns that you know this is just a tar brush that applies to everyone and everything. Um, because I think, why not? Like, why not be the one that helps guide people in the right direction? Exactly. We're still regulated, just like everyone else. Um, so fair enough. Um, what else? What have you been working on? A lot. I think I started prepping some uh, notes for this session, but uh, they start to get a bit long, longer than the questions themselves, as yeah. usual. Uh, I'm not sure if we covered it last week, but remember we had a client call in and ask for our golden rules or our, you know, a, a, a two-page oh, yeah, summary of our investment yeah. philosophy. Did you yes. put that up? Uh, I don't think we did. No, I haven't seen it. Are I, you going? Have you done it? I said two pages. It end up six, as anything I do <laughs> tends to be. Six pages. Drew just loves the word count. Yeah. Basically pulled uh, pulled together, uh, and we discussed it on our monthly update for our Waddle Partners clients this week too. Oh, your video, which yep. is on YouTube. Yep. Yep. Uh, and basically put the. Is 10, that gone live? Uh, no, not be next week. At okay. some point next, next week. week. So next in the week we'll, ahead, we'll share it. Yep, yep. Cool. And that was basically ten of the golden rules. We we say everything's golden at at Waddle Partners. Gold is our logo. Yep. Retirement is we see as the golden years. It doesn't have to have the negative connotation that it tends to. Um, mm-hmm. And these are the golden rules of investing and and what we've built with Atchison's. Yep. Um, as to how money should be managed in retirement. Can, do you have one in front of you? Yeah, I copied a couple. So Morgan Housel, I'll have to... Oh, classic. <laughs> Coming out with a new book, by the way. Credit to him yeah, as well. credit to Morgan. We should just have credit to Morgan. Like, he's yeah. sitting in the room. Well done, Morgan. <laughs> he gets enough of a mention on every episode. Uh, yeah, go on. I think maybe a big one a lot of people forget, and we talk about a lot, is that asset allocation mm. is paramount. Super boring. But asset allocation, we know, drives the majority of returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we think that's the number one and the first part of every discussion we have mm-hmm. on the investment side. And then the second would be be agnostic to product, which is something I think we stress a lot on this, that it can be very personal. So being agnostic to product is use an ETF, use a managed fund, use a stock, use whatever vehicle you want to mm. and which suits your objectives. Don't be you know pigeonholed into a certain strategy. And I think the same should apply across advice as well as individual investors. Mm, absolutely. That's great. I love this. So when you bring these golden rules out, 10 of them, you said? Yes. Yeah, we should pop on the website and we'll also share it with our listeners. So if you want to see what Drew really thinks. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm, I'm, did you? I'm not honest on here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you, uh, did you mean to bring this piece of paper into the... Yeah, so, I was trying to show off. Okay, so Drew's brought in three pieces of paper. It's a quarterly uh, update, I think it is. Yeah, quarterly update uh, that he sends to all clients on the performance of the model portfolios at Waddle. Yes. Now, one of the things... Oh, you're going to quiz me on this. ...as not agnostic. And what's the beta on this book? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here you've got uh, Charter Hall Long Whale Rate. I actually interviewed Stephen Bennett of Direct, Direct Property from Charter Hall. His, that was fantastic, actually. It comes up on the show pretty soon. Um, I was really impressed. But why... Do you include the charter hall long way of REIT and not the direct property fund? In this case, yeah, and it, easier exposure uh, and not I more liquid. Yeah, more liquid, easy to implement, uh, and pr- I mean it provides exactly the same. Exp- I think it's slightly lower cost potentially as well, yeah. um, and it can be traded on the ASX rather than having to do a application form or withdrawal form in this instance, mm-hmm. um, which can have a bit of delay. Not that we plan on selling that asset anyway. Yeah. Um, but super interesting, you know, they own service stations, yeah. uh, logistics centers, social infrastructure, a mm. whole range of really long leased assets. So it's mm, really good. Um, so I was actually going to do a buy, hold, sell with you. So buy, hold, sell, tailored suits. <laughs> tailored suits. I wore the jacket yesterday if you didn't see that. Oh, no. I did yeah. see the white shirt there. That was lovely. Crisp. Yep. Yeah. You got blue one on today. That's nice. Um, Drew's now Definitely. sponsored by Country Road as well. Just in case <laughs> trying. You know, Country Road, if you're listening. Drew, honestly, it's, it's where it's all happening. Finance podcast. Um, okay. Buy, hold, sell, Lululemon. 
it's a buy for me. A buy. I was worried. Yeah. Uh, I was worried that they were getting too much inventory, but turns out, you know, Fine. leggings keep selling. <laughs> yeah, Drew keeps and buying. And so do the men's <laughs> shorts. I'm due for another order as well. We actually do have a question. They today just fit so well. Them. Yeah, it's a nice fit. Um, last one: buy, hold, sell Telstra. Oh, I think it's a hold now. That's it. So this is a not mm. to brag, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Humble brag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said it the highest points since 2017. <laughs> so six year high it for Telstra. You can't trade market. And it's all, well, many people, because of their dealings with Telstra over the last yeah. five years, probably don't think it is that much of a quality company. Mm. It is just a pretty quality, boring company that runs mobile infrastructure and a few other things. So yeah. everyone's kind of flocking to that quality, air, uh, quotes. air quotes. Yep. Uh, at the moment, and Telstra has been a beneficiary. By the way, Drew hates buy, hold, sell for stocks. So I refuse. <laughs> that's why I did it. To write them up. <laughs> so that's why I did it. He's, uh, I'm looking at the model portfolio now. It's like not many stocks compared to uh, all the funds and ETFs in there. Okay, so other things. Uh, we appointed a new marketing manager today. I want to say new. We've never had one before. So um, <laughs> brand new. Uh, Mel Vincent joined the RAS team this week, which I'm really excited about. You'll probably be hearing from her in some podcasts upcoming. Uh, we're also starting to work on an ETF series with Southwealth, which is a bit of fun. We've got all of the major ETF providers involved. They'll be rolling out over the next five weeks, kind of like how we did our passive income series for Southwealth um, in January. And finally, we are like we're just doing a litmus test on RASC events, uh, which we may be running in uh, partnership with uh, a group known as the Inside Network, um, which all of you may know. Uh, at least if you're an advisor, you will know who the Inside Network is. Uh, fair to say, Australia's best events for financial advisors and institutions, Drew? In no bias ways. there, but sure. No bias. <laughs> no bias, but they are in our office. Yes. Uh, they're a wonderful team. And Drew and Jamie oversee that. Um, but yeah, so keep an eye out. Keep your ears to the podcast uh, because there may be announcements about that towards the end of this year. We will be running events. Okay. Yeah, shout out to the Muriels on that too, wouldn't they? Shout out to the Muriels. Um, they are legends in the making. Uh, we... Also, uh, we are trying to do a personal challenge of getting Andrew Derrimuth uh, to make an appearance on any live news broadcast. So if you do know any I don't know, anchors or producers of major television studios, we do have an economist that is trying to make a profile. We're going on a bit of a PR blitz for Andrew Derrimuth. Maybe even Dr. Andrew Derrimuth, if you think about it. So- I can't do that. I explained this at home yesterday. And the answer was, so you're going to... Uh, you're going to present as a fake person. Yeah. <laughs> so the basic what if people idea. know you as Andrew Derriman from now on? <laughs> so the idea is we're trying to get Drew onto a major something or other to lend his expert opinion on economics as Andrew Derriman. <laughs> well, I'm, I can't be more wrong than anyone else, can I? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe this is Starting a new calling. too negative. Maybe this is a new calling. Anyway. Everyone's, so did you see the uh, predictions for rate cuts now? Oh, really? They've, they've changed. Oh. So I think it was uh, sometime this week, everyone came out and said they now expect a rate cut in February 2024. Mm. It's getting closer. They're bringing it in. I need two more. I haven't changed. Two more months this way. Everyone's It could be a double cut as well. And there's no meeting in January, so Maybe technically that could forward. be the first like one happy, year. Like Merry Christmas, everyone, <laughs> from Andrew Derrimuth. <laughs> <laughs> He's all of a sudden, economist has just taken the country by storm. <laughs> I only uh, predict one thing. Yeah. But um, I do it correctly. Last week you talked about um Michael Collo. Yes. And this week I didn't I, I wasn't privy again. to this, but um he's the the quant trader and he's like a real tech guy. Um but I th did you do the the chat GBT thing this week? Yes, we uh, we had a quick so across our businesses in here. There's uh, three or four businesses. I don't think you're invited. Sorry, Owen. Uh, you must have been busy. Okay. Uh, we held a one of the internal guys that runs data and artificial intelligence for the Insight Network. Mm -hmm. uh, ran a virtual kind of session on how to use ChatGPT mm -hmm. within your daily tasks, whether that's creating, you know, writing articles, changing the language or tone of articles, prepping social posts, all kinds of really basic applications, but Michael Collo is the next level of that. I think his business is called Evolved Reasoning. Evolved so he, Reasoning. Yeah. Okay. So he did a few sessions at our, for financial advisors and we just had a meeting with him before where we were planned to roll out a kind of masterclass and in-person case study using that to, make, to have for real world applications hmm. um, and, and kind of encourage people to use it to help grow their businesses. Cool. You know, it's a great, if you're doing interviews, great tool, um, 
just go like, can you write me some prompts based on these things? Yeah. Um, and then you can take that and then make it your own. Obviously, it's just a real just the efficiencies to be had from these language models that are off the chain. Um, so so impressive. Uh, so why wouldn't you use them? Basically, okay. What else have you been working on, mate? Before we get to questions, uh, provide a pretty out there advice to a client this week. Oh. <laughs> If not out there, not out there in terms of inappropriate. Uh, I think it was a bit surprised. Maybe I was surprised when I said it too. Uh, so quite a long-term client. He's in his 50s, started a business five years ago, or bought another business and been scaling up. It's going incredibly well mm-hmm. um, during the pandemic. Uh, and now he's he started talking to me about tax deductions and should he take out mortgages to to get tax deductions or buy a property or do like this or that. Like investment properties. Yeah, because so, yeah. he's starting to pay, because he's profitable and making quite a significant profit. He's worried about tax. As and in, I, he would buy them in the business. Uh just general in his own name. Okay. Take off a couple of million dollars in debt, just yep. to keep accelerating. I basically said, uh, <laughs> "Don't f it up." <laughs> it's it's. Man, I probably <laughs> you know, call the, your the, advisor. Don't. Yeah, the the, the uh, uh, but it's. I mean, it's simple. The role of an advisor is to stop you from making mistakes. And I look at his business; it's going incredibly well. It'll be able to be sold for a reasonable amount. That'll be more than enough to retire on. He's reasonably you know paid off most of most debt sitting in an incredibly strong position kids have finished school all that sort of thing mm. and you're like why would you then go and add additional leverage to a situation that you don't need to i probably could have said it in a more professional manner um <laughs> but this one probably resonated a bit more <laughs> to be honest i think so he's a bit sh- i think he's a bit shocked <laughs> yeah um well i guess that's the that's the essence of the message right don't f it up yeah. Um, which makes sense. Maybe that could be the title for the show. Particularly big strategic decisions like that. Well, you you got the magnification of leverage, right? Exactly. Could he, like, I don't know, this person's situation, but I assume maybe he could just do one instead of two or three or like moderation, walk them back a bit. I don't know. Yeah, or just focus on your business and keep expanding it and rather than take your focus away. I think it's key. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talk about this a lot, like having too many irons and too many fires, you, you just end up getting burnt. It's... um. Yeah, it, it's focus is one of the most important things in any business. Uh, for and even for an investor, having focus is so important. Um, do one thing, do it really well before moving on. Um, maybe if you have got co-founders or whatever co-business owners, you can do that. Uh, OPEC production cuts was other news that's in Drew's list. I'm just stealing that. Um, yeah, right when you thought energy prices couldn't go any lower, yep. OPEC cuts production and prices go up again, just in time for Easter. Welcome. Yeah. yeah, I was paying two bucks at the Bowser. Yeah. Or in two twenty it could be. Oh jeez. Get the seven eleven fuel up, you can lock in the prices yeah. for seven days. I don't know how long it's gonna help me for, but uh, <laughs> maybe fill up once. Uh, I always feel sorry for people. Look, well, I feel sorry and I'm just like a sucker. When they drive past and they're like in this huge thing and I'm like, How much fuel are you paying? I got one of those. <laughs> yeah. Not they're not that big, but big enough. And I'm like that must be like 200 bucks yeah. to fill up. Probably do it twice a week. Like crazy stuff. You see on the run just sold for 1.15 billion this week. Really? Which we've only, there's only one or two in Australia, in Victoria, but a massive chain in uh, Adelaide. Ah. Okay. Interesting backstory. So it was, uh, I think an immigrant family moved, couldn't find a job. So he, there was a, an ad to buy a service station with a house attached to it hmm. and turn that into, I think it owned Smoke Mart and one of the gift box stores okay. as well as this massive chain of service stations just sold for i think it was viva energy for hmm. 1.15 billion wow there you go on the podcast servos servos <laughs> yeah getting out just in time before they become like electric stations or something i don't even know well they still have convenience i guess um okay so we've got a lot of questions sent in this week and just a reminder that if you do ask a question we can't give you personalized financial advice you're not necessarily a financial planner for that um, like say uh, Drew Meredith, uh, who's a fan of the show, a regular on the show as well, um, and say I'm a fan of the show. Yeah, we've, I'm sorry, <laughs> Andrew Derby. I thought I was talking to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I never know these days. Um, so, so, <laughs> so no, you'd have to speak speak to a financial planner who can take into account your needs, goals, or objectives. And also, um, if you contact a financial advisor who is a licensed tax advisor, they can also talk about the tax consequences of your investments or your strategy. Slightly different to an accountant, but a lot of people don't know that there's also a tax practitioners board um, and advisors have to apply to that as well. Um, and of course, if we mention a product, please read the product disclosure statement, uh, which we probably will do because um, I guess this is, here we go. Bingo, bango, bongo says, this one. 
And this is a good question. I like these open-ended questions. Yeah. I think these are the best questions. If you were only allowed to dollar cost average into one ASX share, in brackets, individual stocks, they've taken ETFs and funds out of it. They knew what we were going to do. Uh, for the next 20 years, <laughs> what would it be? Tough one. <laughs> I've got two. I, I wouldn't go off the top 50. Anyway, like, I mean, maybe like I out, you mean out, out of the top 50. Yeah. Yeah. It won't be Telstra. I'll put that out there. <laughs> I think it's a great income and slow growing stock. Mm -hmm. This one I love, as everyone knows, I love diversification. And mm -hmm. it'd be the either West Farmers or Macquarie. You know, two pretty big giants that have a track record of the kind of conglomerates in their own way. So West Farmers has Bunnings, Kmart, Lithium, uh, West CEF, which is like chemicals. chemicals and fertilizer, Catch of the Day, which is struggling, but all the other ones are doing well. Macquarie has asset management, banking, capital markets, all kinds of different mm. applications. And I just kind of like the... Ma so I'm picking two, not one. Yeah, that's right. You're diversifying. Good <laughs> um, hedge. And two massive high quality. Like the, you'd consider them two global leaders that just happen to be in Australia. Mm, absolutely. Um, did you plant this question? No, I did not. You did not. And it wasn't, not that I'm aware it's not a friend of mine either. Okay. Because this is very on brand for me right now. I didn't put it in. But this question is really good because I, this is what I've been spending the last few months on, actually. It's this idea of anti-fragile companies. I think I mentioned it last week. How uh, companies that don't break. Because I got this question two or three years ago and it stumped me. I was like, I don't know. But since then, I've been studying companies that have stood the test of time. So I'll give you some examples. I actually went into detail about this last week on this self-help program. But uh, I've also got a write-up coming, and I did one last month for RAS Core members. There's a link in the show notes if you want to become a member, by the way. It's $9.99 a month. It's less than your Netflix. What's more important, you know what I'm saying? So um, I would go with something like West Farmers, so not to be too unoriginal, or a holding company like Washington Hacksaw Pattinson. Yep. Because the thing about this, if you ask this question of 20 years, this basically you, you basically have no predictive ability. So basically all you've got is to ask yourself, what will still be here in 20 years? And what's most likely to be here in 20 years is something that is anti-fragile, meaning that it can't break. And so if you think about the businesses that can't break, Wes Farmers is definitely one. Macquarie has different divisions. That's probably not going to break, been around for a long time. Um, but also Washington Hate Soul Pattinson. And you may remember from last week, I broke down all the reasons why that might be the case. But there are other types of businesses that I would describe as anti-fragile. I just wouldn't be prepared to back over 20 years. Companies like S&P Global, credit ratings, uh, MISCI, which is indices, uh, Fitch ratings. Data. Data. All those types of businesses. Even um, a business in Australia, PEXA. Yeah. This is a bit more of a contentious one. I wouldn't hold it for 20 years, but maybe five or 10, uh, which is the business that does all of the property settlements in the country. When I say all of them, I mean like 80, high 80s percent of all properties in the country. Basically, you have to use it. Um, it was sold by a link group uh, listed on the ASX. Uh, so I would look at these businesses that what I would call anti-fragile. And when there's a the sign of these businesses is founder-led or operated long-term focus, strong capital structure, profitable, but also in a crisis, they tend to be offensive, not defensive. Yeah. And that's because they have the long-term focus. So that's kind of the tell of these businesses. It's almost services and industrials, isn't it, yeah. that you're looking at? Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Less yeah. cyclicals or yeah, cyclical to the point that they they become more service. Yeah. Well, yeah. even if you take a business like, say, Alphabet, like that owns Google, I held shares for many years. Um, this is a business that was so unbelievably dominant, kind of redefined the entire industry. However, the business now has been sideswiped, you could say, in a big way by these language models. So Google's got Bard, which is coming out now, but ChatGPT and all of these have already got the first mover advantage in artificial intelligence uh, for, for language models. And so like that's a business that you thought was the best business on earth, couldn't be broken, and it got sideswiped uh, pretty quickly. I'm not saying that it's fully broken or anything. I'm still Googling everything. I don't. That's my predominant source of information. And I think that's still going to be here for a long time. But I would say that people now realize that even the tech companies can be disrupted through incredible innovation. Definitely. Great question, though, from Bingo Bango Bongo, BBB. Next question comes from Zippington. 
This is a Confucius question. <laughs> Why would you have a allocation Confucius to says. bonds over a dividend ETF such as VHY? Don't they both provide income? So let's just rephrase that. Why would you invest in bonds when you can just buy a dividend ETF that has income? Can I use my two favorite words? Uh, unpack. <laughs> no, not unpack. <laughs> Unprecedented. <hate> <laughs> It depends yeah, okay. on what you're seeking to achieve. Okay. I mean, two massively different asset classes with completely different risk profiles. What do you mean? They probably look different uh, over the last 12 months. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the most basic level, income from a share, so a dividend, is discretionary and it's subject to the decisions of a board of that company, which is subject to their profit, profitability or the sales and whether that company's making money. Mm. So as we saw during the pandemic, this income from dividends can disappear or be cut in half overnight because they decide they need to keep cash on the balance sheet. Income from bonds is contracted, guaranteed and secured legally by either by a mortgage or or by a contract. So regardless, you will always get the interest and the income and that's noting its interest. So it's repayment of buying a bond is a loan to that company. So they're returning interest to you. Mm -hmm. It's not discretionary. And it has to be paid according to the terms of that that contract, whereas dividends are the complete opposite. So I think, but I think both have a role to play. And more more importantly, why would you buy one over the other? It just depends on. I mean, they both perform differently in different market conditions, and this comes back to that concept of diversification. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> I like this. Uh, you want so one of the reasons I think there's this like un- lack of understanding around why we diversify. And a lot of people are like, well, why don't I just have 100% in shares? They've done the best. I'll just put all my money in there. Um, and you made the comment last week when I was listening back to the episode about uh, index funds. You listened back to us. I did last week. And I th- <laughs> Legal <laughs> issues or? <laughs> it was a nightmare. I can't stand my... It wasn't the CMC market. One, was <laughs> no, no, that was the week before. Uh, that's, I think that's going to be an ongoing saga. No, so um, you made the case that like some people only use index funds uh, and while the it's a it's a matter of debate which is open um, it's also important to understand that a lot of people don't use all index funds because of the volatility the ups and downs yeah and so if you yeah. the reason why portfolio managers or sorry I should say financial advisors design portfolios with multi-asset my, in mind is that it's easier for someone not to get out of investing when they are actively taking strategies to limit the downside. Yeah. So I'm a pretty firm believer that I'm very confident, probably overconfident, you could say, in having a lot of my money in growth-focused investments, but I still have some in my portfolio um, and it will probably increase in time, even though I have a huge understanding. And so people just, I don't know, Zippington, I don't know who you are, I don't know your situation, but a lot of people tend to go through this cycle in their investing where they do think early on, why don't I just go 100% shares? Yeah. Uh, but it, we're trying to design a portfolio that grows not for two or three years, but grows for 10 or 20 years. And that's the key. And it may make sense to only have income if your objective is to yeah. maximize your, your income from Aussie stocks. But yeah, if, you're, if yeah. you're concerned about volatility and you might make a decision that to sell because it's fallen significantly, you know, the ASX has fallen 40 or 50% at different periods and has, was down 10 or 15% in a short period of time, 2020. Yeah, a lot of and, dividends were cut. And a lot of people well. were selling at the same time. So if you can see through that, it's, it do, it's very personal and what your objective is. So we'd naturally prefer having a higher allocation to those legislated interest payments that you get from bonds for retiree portfolios yep. in multiple forms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a good question though, because a lot of people do think this way. A lot of people are this way inclined. Uh, the VHY ETF, just for, we probably should have covered that, just what that is. It's just an ETF that targets dividends from Australian companies, which yep. is very effective. You could say it's the, it is the most popular Australian ETF that targets dividends. Uh, it's about 70 or so stocks from Vanguard. Importantly, it uses forecast dividends so you don't get caught in yield traps or where companies may seem to have a big dividend yield but don't pay it. Uh, so it's a good it's a good ETF. I think it's, um, for, for me personally, for Australian income, uh, from shares from Australian, from, from income from Australian shares rather, uh, it is a, is a good ETF. It's probably my pick of the bunch. Okay, this one has something to do with a thorn a barge pole, Lick, and Andrew Derrimuth. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like the is this is complete. You know, you know where they make is it AI makes music and it has yeah. that certain uh, pattern that yeah. work makes it a hit every time. Is this? <laughs> it's like is this a new. It's like how content is cut through. Cut through is king. It's like how they say all the flavors of wine when you go to the cellar door and you they're just making it up. They just like chuck random numbers in and let us sorry and just like, yeah cherry. I was stuck on Instagram as you do. Yeah, classic. Middle aged man watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a video of that people saying what they tasted yeah. and then the, the, the guy just kept telling one person no that's incorrect <laughs> there's no wrong answers but there's no lemon <laughs> <laughs> that's true though I feel like they just have like a they have green I, apple I think chat GBT <laughs> should have got a hint from like the, the the vineyards in that you just have like a hundred adjectives and you just mix them together and then that's <laughs> that's the wine anyway <laughs> the people who know their stuff are just going to be hating me right now that's one thing we did in this AI training course yeah so can you write a welcome post for a, a new staff member joining your team yeah and it was like exactly the same as what we'd written for <laughs> every other person we just pulled it off the it's water like, no, website. we mean it <laughs> Okay, old timer with a big tank says, Peter Thornhill wouldn't touch an ETF with a barge pole, exclamation mark, five dot points. Uh, I was just listening to your Lick podcast and it reminded me of Peter's interview with Alex on Big Swinging Stocks. That's Alex from uh, Self Wealth's podcast, Big Swinging Stocks. She's great. He goes on to say, he thinks ETFs are just rehashed managed funds, in brackets, old fashioned crap and does not like the trust structure and tax implications for ETFs. He's an investing legend, dot, dot, dot. Is he right to avoid ETFs, even though they may be cheaper? Is the growth of ETFs a misguided fad? I think it's a fantastic question, and I think there's kind of a lack of uh, opinions in finance a lot of the time, where everyone's like, too, maybe we're a bit the same occasionally, mm -hmm. where everyone's a bit too scared to kind of que question each other or disagree with each other. Yeah. Um, so I think Peter, I actually had to Google Peter Thornhill, no offense. Um, I just don't spend that much what? time. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> right, there may be offense, <laughs> not intended, of course. Uh, but I think, I mean, it, it's everything to everyone. You know, it's a, I hate saying broad church. It's like saying unpack, but, but there's different approaches and different products that, that work differently for different people. So I think everything's got a pro and con. And there's some points there that, you know, ETFs are just a pass-through entity. They give you an exposure to a benchmark or something they track, mm -hmm. and the tax implications are yours. They just pass it through. They're not they're not holding on to tax capital gains. They're not uh, building up income before they distribute. They literally just provide you what's on the label. Um, I think comparing the managed funds is very very difficult. Diffi uh, different though. Um, I think that was more from the tax perspective, which they are yeah. a managed fund. Yeah, they just but they pass it through. But if this is like where, if you take the literal meaning of the word managed fund. An ETF is just a managed fund behind the scenes. Exactly. But when we take the industry jargon and we say managed fund, typically what we mean by managed fund is an actively managed fund. So an active fund manager is making decisions to buy or sell stocks or bonds or whatever. But when we think of ETFs, even though it shouldn't be thought of this way, people just think of index funds. Yeah. Legally, behind the scenes are the same thing. And an ETF is just a way to get in and out. So maybe from the tax perspective and i do think that from the tax perspective he is probably correct you can't control your taxable gains but that doesn't necessarily make it a bad thing but you know what i mean like if you have so illicit, I mean, what's the alternative a listed investment company which is what he would was talking about um he's got a book called motivated money which is like a really um, impressive book uh and a listed investment company, because it is a company structure, can hold on to the profits that it makes yep. and then can pay you franking credits with dividends later on if it wants to. It doesn't have to. But an ETF has to send that back to you. We've covered this before. So there are benefits to having fully franked income with regularity versus these weird statements that you get from an ETF that says like, here's your distribution. Some capital gains. Here's some capital gains. It's not tax effective. Foreign income. Yeah. yeah. And it's, just, it's a bit weird. So I get that. Um, but I think that. But there's a flip side. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, maybe do you want to do the flip side? I don't mind. It was. No, yeah, no. The flip like, side is that, like there are benefits, numerous benefits to ETFs, um, and like some of those are transparency, super low costs, like ease of use. You can just trade them freely back yeah. and forth. Um, 
you also have the like the regulation, the reliability of knowing that like there's these are financial products, so they're being properly regulated. Uh, whereas the companies, you also have the regulation, but it's also a company, so it's a bit different. There's a few decisions that can be made at different levels, and I, I think it. And this is what we've talked about this before. We've quite had this debate. There are certain times when I would use a listed investment company, yeah. like for private markets, if it's investing in something that's illiquid, uh, like small cap shares, maybe you can use a LIC um, or an unlisted fund. You wouldn't use an ETF for a small cap fund. So like there are instances where they do make sense. But do I think that, my personal opinion, like is it a mis- is it, are ETFs a misguided fad? No. no. So that's, a, that's, why, that's way too extreme. Is it good for a headline to say that? Yes. Uh, should you consider using both? Yes. Do you need to do one or the other? No, you can do both. Exactly. That's, so that's another one of the golden rules. It's oh. and not or, ah. like or versus. It so seems like to be passive active, versus passive. active. Income no, versus it's growth. Passive and, and active. It's income and growth. It's yeah. value and growth. Yeah. It's always and, and it's just getting the blend of the right two. Yeah. Um, and I think Hard that's... and shoffs. Yeah. Soft shell. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Did have some tacos. Lululemon and Country Road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> both sponsors of Drew. But the, uh, I mean, they've both got drawbacks. So ETFs are great, low co- lowest cost product you can find, but they generally only track the index and they you have to pay brokerage to buy them. Yeah. And the brokerage can be more than their actual management fees. Yeah, sometimes. absolutely they can. Yeah. Um, but then you look at the LIC market. And yeah, it was great during the pandemic and the ability to smooth out dividends. But 97% of the market trades at a discount to its NTA. Mm. And they're mainly the ones that trade at a premium to their NTA uh, aren't able to change their portfolios that much. Because they've got all the embedded capital gains. Exactly. So it's... Can't sell to BHP. I think it's using, matching your objectives to what the product, the pros and cons of each product, uh, I think is key. And you could always, it's definitely worth blending them both. They're very much a slow burn, uh, but you don't want to buy, I wouldn't necessarily use it LIC as your index or your your core exposure all the time. Yeah, it's interesting because like Africa and Argo, they're in like the oh, could be, I'm getting this wrong, it's the top of my head, but I think their management fees are equivalent to around about zero point two percent. Someone from Africa's gonna email me and say it's this. But anyway, that's like pretty low. Like for a lick, that's very low. But in any case, we're gonna move on to the next question because you can use ETFs and you can use licks, just be aware of that tax situation. I think the benefits of ETFs outweigh the cons. That's my preference. That's why we tend to use ETFs for the core. But most of our audience is accumulators. Like I wouldn't come in if I was a financial planner like Drew or Jamie or whatever. I wouldn't come in and say, sell all your licks and we're going to have straight ETFs because it defeats the purpose. Like, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I don't think they're a misguided fad and I think the growth in them uh, is because people have realized how important cost is, but also how important just being exposed to the market is. And yeah. it's incredibly easy to get exposed and know exactly what you're buying. Yeah. Uh, the investor nominator <laughs> says. Investor nominator. Investor nominator says, Hi, Owen. This is just addressed to me. <laughs> I am a young investor trying to put a portion of my pay into building an investment portfolio. That's fantastic. Thank you. We will not give personalized advice, just as FYI. I would consider myself a risk seeking investor. I will buy and hold, and I don't want to touch the investment for at least 10 years to come. I'm a firm believer in technology and I think it will drive the most growth in the long term. Despite being more volatile, the NASDAQ 100 has outperformed the S&P 500 in the long term over 10 plus years. When I researched what's inside the NASDAQ 100, I truly think it comprises some of the best companies in the world. Lululemon is also in there, Drew. My current portfolio really listening closely. (laughs) My current portfolio outside of super will be eighty percent NDQ, twenty percent emerging markets. And that's the Asia ETF. That's from Beta Shares, if I'm not mistaken. My first question will be what is your guys' opinion on using a Nasdaq ETF for the entirety of your core portfolio? As I don't want any Aussie exposure outside my super. The second question is would it be worth the hassle in the long term? to directly buy US listed NASDAQ 100 ETF in VESCO QQQM compared to the Aussie listed NDQ. The gap between the management fees is quite large. It's only 0.15% for QQQM as opposed to 0.48% for NDQ. I'm going to just add an extra disclaimer in here. You've given us a lot of information about yourself, Invest Terminator, uh, which is great and we do appreciate the color, but we will try and answer this question in two parts. Number one, 
Is 80% of money in just the NASDAQ 100 sensible? And the second thing that we will be answering is, is it worth going to US markets to get your ETF exposure? Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think buying the NASDAQ isn't a bad thing. You're buying 100 stocks, so you are somewhat diversified, but you are very exposed to consumer uh, consumer spending and to technology. So yeah. I generally say being prudent, and this is from a in approaching it from investing retirees capital generally, yeah, generally, is that you probably want a bit more diversification in your core, noting that you've got some Australia overseas. Maybe it's Europe, maybe it's the Dow or another exposure that has broader sectors. Yeah. But if you're comfortable with that risk, then it's a low cost or semi-low cost, maybe not low cost. <laughs> Actually, I just went <laughs> the whole spectrum there. Uh, but you got 100, you're getting exposure to 100 stocks for, for one. So you do have a level of, level of diversification. And from memory, the... Uh, concentration isn't as high in the NASDAQ as it is in, say, the S&P 500. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think, still 100 stocks. Like, if this was 30 years ago, we'd be saying 100 stocks, sweet, that's plenty. But nowadays, um, like there's diversification within the asset class, so like shares or global shares or US shares, but there's also diversification across asset classes, and I think that is being missed here. If you If you plot the risk returns of all the different asset classes, all of the different things that you could invest your money into, emerging markets, which was mentioned in this, and US tech stocks are probably at the very top end in terms <laughs> of, of the risk. risk. Yeah. So even if you... So the the, 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 the question I also said that doesn't want Aussie shares. But because that, they've got it in super. Because they've got it in super. But if you're quite young, I mean, you're also... What you're doing by focusing just on the US would be also getting just one currency. Yeah, which can influence the outcome significantly. Yeah, of what you do, so particularly now where the currency is, like Drew and I love to say, we have a couple of quantitative fellows over here. It's near the Bollinger Band or the two standard <laughs> deviations. So, meaning that it's like at a point where you the had currency a hat on. <laughs> it could uh, it could substantially uh, deviate from your expected returns just based on currency alone. I don't think the I, I don't mind an aggressive investment strategy i just think that it needs to be you still need some exposure across asset classes i think uh even if like this is all global shares yeah I th- and it is super aggressive it's hard to know like if we were look we'd look at your entire asset yeah. base and if you're younger or and you are you're saying you are young um you still want a reasonable level of diversification yeah. and you want it like what happens if the nasdaq falls another 20 percent and it's down 40 percent from its eye mm. How confident are you that you won't sell it at that point? That's the thing. And that's what we talked about before yeah. where people get scared. We'll often say hold certain assets in your super fund and certain assets outside. And to be honest, we given the tax benefits in super, we tend to say hold the highest risk and highest growth potential assets in super because the tax is lower mm. and you can't control the capital. You, you, you're paying lower capital gains tax. So you want assets that you can't control the capital gains in there, that being funds and ETFs as we mentioned before, mm-hmm. and you want stocks outside because you can control when you buy and sell them. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the other thing was getting direct exposure via the US, which you can do that. Uh, you have to fill out a W8 Ben form so you're not uh, double taxed, basically, for the, uh, the withholding tax that you get between Australia and the US. Uh, we get this question a lot. A lot of institutional investors will do this. They'll just go straight to the US because for them, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, in Australia, you do have the benefit of having a HIN, so a holder identification number, which you're still investing in the same thing at the end of the day, but you do have a kind of an added protection. Uh, if you invest in the Australian version, you get uh, the W8 Ben form is already filled in for you by the ETF provider because it's Australia domiciled fund. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, I would say, we've had this question once before in a different forum, the the cost is meaningful. Like I, I, I feel like it's meaningful. Thirty basis points. The beta shares won't like me saying that, but that's the truth. I think you're going to see it continue to fall. Like we saw BlackRock and beta shares go into competition on their uh, and their Australian shares. Yeah, forty eight's pretty high. I'm sure there's a, it's not a cheap index, so they're obviously paying Nasdaq to yeah. to copy their index too. But uh, that that'll continue to fall. I think that might be the only. Is there one other one? I don't think that they've got the hedged one. And that's probably why it's more expensive. So if someone brings in competition, even like Invesco's QQQ, um, that would bring the, the price down. So I'd suggest that price will fall. And we just generally say how to how do you keep yourself 
as simple as possible. Yeah. Last thing, you, you generally pay higher brokerage trading overseas. You introduce currency risk. It's probably more difficult to hedge. Uh, and it'll probably cost you more doing your tax returns because you yeah. you've got to do all these statements. extra forms. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I'd almost keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Um, you're not stupid. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Uh, the next question actually talks about, we've got two more questions um, and then we'll just nip the last one in the bud. But this one here is Mr. Super Confused. This is quite a technical question. Um, so it's going to apply to some people, but it will be interesting to people who maybe are at this around about this stage of life or thinking about this generally. So Mr. Super Confused says, my question is regarding super. It's actually quite a little bit more than that. From what I understand, when you pass away, if you have a normal super fund or industry fund, your account is automatically sold and then the cash will be distributed as per your will. Now, if you unfortunately pass away during a severe downturn and intend on passing on or donating your super account balance, isn't this the worst time to consider selling? We are all told to hold and never sell when the market drops 40 to 60%. From what I understand, with an SMSF and a will stipulating the actions that you want to be taken, if, for example, you only held ASX shares, at least the whole number of shares will be transferred to your beneficiaries. It just makes a lot more sense if you wish to pass on generational wealth or donate a substantial amount to charity to set up an SMSF where it doesn't have to sell at the worst time. Now, obviously, we can only give personalized advice. Uh, sorry, generalized advice. If you want personalized advice, you have to see a financial planner on this one, and uh, maybe even an accountant if you wanted to discuss tax implications. But what I would say is, this is there's a fair bit of confusion in this question. Definitely, and common and, questions though. And, very but it's common. a very common question because yeah. a lot of people want to know what happens with their money when they die, and also, how does a will affect super? And also, can I set up like a charitable thing when I pass away? Which is very common. So, Drew, let's tackle this. Where do we start? The first thing I'd say is death is a compulsorily, oh, sorry, a compulsory cashing event for superannuation. Com- yep. Compulsorily acquired. Um, <laughs> so, essentially, regardless of where your superannuation is held, if you die, it must be cashed out. Yep. Subject, that's a but. Can I say but? Or yep. it depends? Yeah, it Probably depends. Probably but. Um, but it depends. But it depends. Uh, there are a couple of exemptions to that. One is you don't, you know, as a compulsory cashing event, if depending on the age of your uh, the potential recipient of that superannuation, if it's your partner and they're over generally 55 years of age, they'll be able to continue receiving, they could continue receiving a pension and keep all the assets within superannuation. Uh, outside of that, and I think a, a, a financial financially dependent minor, they're the only ways you can keep a deceased person's money in superannuation. Otherwise, it would have to be paid out to the nominated beneficiary which is another part of the question that we have to answer as well yep. uh, and then treated accordingly but the big one there is the superannuation benefits are not automatically paid to a will yep they're actually uh, non-estate assets so for your will to treat your superannuation assets uh, to be to cover your superannuation assets it has to be you have to tell your super fund smsf or not that your balance is to be paid directly to your will or your legal personal representative and then are treated according to the terms of the will. Yeah. So let me, I love this. <laughs> unpack that. Yeah, let's unpack it. Um, no, I think this is a really interesting thing because a lot of people don't know this. They just think if they do their will, everything's sorted. It's not at all. Not at all. Yeah, what happens. Um, so superannuation Inside your super fund, you can do two types of things. You can do a binding or non-binding nomination. It sounds like what it is. Uh, a binding nomination is the the super fund has no discretion. It has to be sent to the person or persons that you nominate in a binding nomination. And then only certain people are able to receive that as well. Exactly. But in a non-binding nomination, someone could challenge and the super fund could have discretion. Yes. So that may mean that the money never gets to your will or your estate as it's known when you die. Uh, And when you die, the trustee and executor get the assets together and the trustee basically uh, executes your will. Um, Now, some people set up a charitable trust before they pass away. Uh, Some people set up the PATH. uh, Private ancillary fund. Private ancillary fund. 
Uh, this is where you basically have the ability to set up a fund of your own that has a charitable uh, intent. Um, and some people just do like a testamentary trust where it sets up after you die, you just have an income stream or something that pays out to kids or relatives or something like that, or your local sports group or whatever you want to do. Uh, you can do all of that. Uh, so it's really important that if you are thinking about this, estate planning is one of the best times to get advice. Uh, so please consider reaching out to a financial advisor who can make this happen for you. I know a lot of people in my network who have wanted to set up like charitable trusts and things like that. Yes. And they've asked me to be in like when I say air quotes advisor to like the trustee to say, how are you guiding the portfolio after his yep. death and things like that. Um, and that's re a really good way. If you have a mass wealth and you don't know what you want to do with it, that's something you can do. And it's probably wary that you can't do that directly from a super fund either. Exactly. So it'd have to go back to the will and yep. then the will would have to dictate the terms. And yeah, you can include your will, your, your estate as a beneficiary, but you can also, you can also only include other dependents. So adult children, spouses, uh, and, and, uh, young children, financial independence as well. Yep. Um, alternatively, if you are in retirement, you could just cash out your super and make a decision before you pass away. Yep. You could start setting things up before you pass away, which is another option, which is another, like just kind of bypass that before you die. It's all sorted. Yep. And then it would be yeah, directly in your, in your will yeah, because exactly. you own it in your personal name. Yep. Great question though. It's, it's I know it sounds technical. Some people are like, man, I'm like 30 years away from dying, but you never know. And also uh, it's a really good question. So in square brackets, funny investment <laughs> pun. Is that code? Is it chat GPT? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, would it be reasonable to treat super as your entire core portfolio and therefore any private slash personal investment as satellite investing? Super in this scenario is being the bulk of the portfolio, long-term, low cost, etc with personal investing being a much smaller amount, potentially higher up the risk curve, etc. True. <laughs> Unless you want me to go first. Oh, no, I'm happy to go first. Core portfolio in super. I think this is the challenge because uh, superannuation is a preserved entity or a preserved entity structure, which means you can't touch it until you turn 60. So what's the purpose of your core? Is it solely on long-term wealth accumulation or are you eventually want to, going to want to generate an income from it? Yeah. It's locked away. You can't get it. So you want to be wary of how much you're putting in there. And then even as we were talking about before, the tax benefits of superannuation are so significant for most people, depending on what your marginal tax rate is, that if, you, if you're expecting your core to be, you know, CPI plus 3%, then you'd probably want your higher risk and your higher growth and your private market things in superannuation because they allow a longer term approach to investing and also the gains on them is going to be taxed significantly lower level. Mm, um, it's a way I kind of broadly think about it. Um, and then do you need money in your own name? What's your life? What, what's your life? So are you going to make other decisions? Are you going to need to buy a house? Do you need a in capital for other reasons? Uh, all, all important considerations when you're looking at it. Mm. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot to this question. And I think that the proof is in the pudding from, I'll add this, tuck, I'll just tuck something on the end here, which is the proof is in the pudding over the last couple of years, in particular this last year, around the risks of having a lot of money in super. Yeah. Uh, it's become more evident in recent times for people now looking at like a cap of $3 million. Thinking, what? Well, that's not that. Not a cap. Not a cap. Just high tax. Just high tax. It was marketed as a cap. Uh <laughs> So I've just, been, I've, I've just been sucked into the marketing. Can you like, do a session about financial headlines? That's it. Don't read the headlines, <laughs> Owen. That's what it said. And then I just like walked away from them. You know, there was already a cap, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. 3.4 million was already the cap. Yeah. True. <laughs> um, okay. So this has been highlighted over the last little while, right? And so I think the thing for people is just to remember that I don't think the regulation and the changes are going away. As more wealth accumulates in super because it is good people who have taken the bait and put a lot of their money in there early may be really surprised in the future with by changes. So I would just say if wealth accumulation should happen outside super but just as much as it should happen inside. Yeah. Um, so that means regularly dollar cost averaging into a core portfolio um, outside of super, whichever way that or shape that takes, um, I would do that and that's what I'm intending to do uh, because ultimately there are different ways you can set, set up your investment strategy and there are different vehicles you could use so i just got made a list of notes here you can hold investments in your own name you can hold it inside an industry or a retail super fund you can hold your investments in an smsf in your partner's name who may have a lower tax threshold 
You may hold them in a company that you set up, but there are some rules around this. In a trust, where you may be able to split income, also speak to your accountant. Or even in a partnership, like an actual legal partnership. So there are so many different ways and different options. There's even investment bonds and insurance bonds that I haven't mentioned. So many different ways to do it. Um, it's not all super and it's not all, uh, I guess, individual names is what I meant to say. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Drew? I was going to say that you know when you think about core versus satellite, if you think about which part's most likely to go wrong or which parts require more patience, that's generally going to be your satellite. They're, yeah. they're the more niche investments that you're putting in, whether that's private equity, whether that's emerging markets, whether that's smaller companies, that's mm-hmm. where more of the growth sits. So I think you almost flip it if you're going to think about it that way. Yeah. That you the, those things are going to have less. Con, it'll it'll have the short term volatility of those will have less impact on your own personal situation. Yep. Whereas your core portfolio will likely be the more consistent part of your returns over a long period of time, and you'd probably prefer that outside superannuation, Good point. particularly if you're younger. Particularly if you want to retire early. Yep. Yep. Uh, last question. Pretty straightforward. Ten bag tea bagger. <laughs> Really just we toe, have a winner. Just toe on the line here. Just toe on the line. Ten bag tea bagger says, if you partake in a dividend reinvestment plan or DRP, what happens to the franking credits? Do you still get them or not? Yes. Yeah, I think it's, you do. Simple. <laughs> yeah. I think there, there's a lot of confusion around this with, div, with dividend reinvestment plans. So effectively, regardless of what option you have set up, you are receiving that dividend mm-hmm. and you are paying tax on that dividend. Which yep. means yes, you get the franking credits. A reinvestment plan is why we've been, we haven't been big fans of it, apart from all the additional work that goes with <laughs> inputting all those yep. new units that come in. Uh, but the biggest issue we see is you're being forced to buy new shares at a price that's dictated to you when that dividend's paid. That's what yep. we've always been wary of. So essentially, you're receiving the dividend and making the discre- non-discretion decision to that buy. you want to reinvest back into that company. That's a buying decision every day. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, what does Beera 4.7 mean? I don't know. Uh, it's in the back of this bottle. Uh, so we've had some great questions today, Drew, and great questioners. Um, we've got to award this week's prize. You win the Value Investor Program, my full curriculum on value investing in companies or businesses, depending on however you want to phrase that. Uh, it takes you end to end. Most people who start the Value Investor Program, Drew, do not finish it, which I'm a little bit upset about and I try to we try to do webinars and we did one last week to try and encourage people to move along Uh, because we know that individual company investing is quite technical and it's quite difficult but this is my complete curriculum that guides you through it anyway my vote for this week in terms of the name is I'm going to go with it because you said it what do you what you think what are you thinking I thought that one of them was referring to us which one was that one old timer with a big tank what do you mean one of the questions because we're Still sports people. Semi-sports people. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, active wear. We still dabble. Okay. What were you taking? I didn't mind, uh, yeah, old time with a big tank. What were you? That's a hard-hitting question about yeah. Peter Thornhill. Yeah. All right. Extra points to old timer <laughs> with a big tank. Let's do it. Yeah. There's also some random question in here from Warren Mungo. It says, what is an ETFS? <laughs> I don't know Sorry. what that was all about. Refer to the one we did uh, on the summer series. Probably the best, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a... There, what is an ETF? Yes. Uh, Warren Munger, check out the summer series that Drew and I did. That's the one with the... That you see the sun in the in, in the, the title of the podcast. All of those are those short format 20-minute episodes which cover one topic. And in one of those, we covered ETFs. So if you wrote in with the name Old Timer with a big tank and you talked about big swinging stocks and... Um, barge poles and these types of things you are this week's winner but as always on the way out we ask our friend andrew derrimuth to step into the office i see the comedian too (laughs) he's everything (laughs) he's about to be on the nightly news i cannot wait for channel nine to pick this up to wear a mustache (laughs) you have to wear like shades even if you're in a studio Uh, okay so here we go what is this week's joke take us away andrew so credit to dad says jokes as usual credit dad says jokes yep my ass? Oh, sorry. <laughs> my wife. Sorry. What? My, my wife asked me today if I had seen the dog bowl. I said, no, I didn't know he could. <laughs> it's a slow Obviously. burn like the first time I told you about Andrew Derriman. <laughs> it takes a while to sink into this one. Do you need me to explain that That's one? Just right? week. I didn't know cricket was a thing. Um... <laughs> Okay, so that was a good one. 
that's a good one. I'd give you a 7 out of 10 for that one, mate. Uh, if you do want to write into us, you want to get in touch, you can send us your questions. Uh, please send us your questions uh, by going to the link in your podcast player that says ask a question. And there's also a link on the Rask website that says ask a question in the menu. Both of those things go to the same place. You just select Australian Investors Podcast and we will answer your question on air. We also like those open-ended questions. There's more philosophical questions like Telstra buy, hold, sell. No, just kidding. We like the ones like which telco <laughs> do you like or things like this or which ETF for this or if you only had X, what would you do? We love those ones. But Drew, this was heaps of fun. If people want to get in contact with you, they can go to waddlepartners.com.au. Alternatively, there is a link in your show notes. So just in the podcast player in front of you, click that and you can get in touch with Jamie, Drew, Roshana and the team for financial planning. Mate, as always, thanks for joining me. Good to see you. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.